Wow, praise the Lord. I want to take this opportunity to greet you in the name of Jesus. What an opportunity to share with you the word of God. I'm called Pastor Godfrey Okumu Africa, part of the pastors of Gaba Community Church. I bring greetings to all of you, our viewers from different locations, from Gaba Community Church, from our senior pastors, and it is a great time together to share the word of God. Now, we are continuing with a series that Pastor Peter began last week. Pastor Peter began a series on the church. The church. So we want to look at the church. And our emphasis is so much in the church in Acts of Apostles. This is what we want to look at. The church in Acts of Apostles. We want to see how did the church in Acts of Apostles begin? How did the church in Acts of Apostles continue? How did the church in Acts of Apostles grow? And how did the church persevere during the persecutions? So these are the things we want to look at. And guys, I want us to begin with a word of prayer. I want us to humble and pray. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I thank you for everybody viewing those who are in their homes, wherever they are. Father, we want to pray for your word. May your word bring life. May your word bring encouragement. May your word bring restoration. We are praying for restoration. That those who are down, those who are low, will be restored spiritually. That their lives will not remain the same. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. May you put us together. May you minister to us together. In the name of Jesus. So, dear brethren, one more time, I'm so happy to share with you the word of God. Now, we want to read one scripture. That is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. Hear what Paul was saying. Paul says, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Let me read one more time. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. So at this time, I want to take this opportunity to first dis discuss with us what is this thing called church? What is this thing called church? Paul is calling it the church of God. What does Paul mean by the church of God? Uh, the church has been mistaken by many things. The church is not a building. That building where you gather from is a church building. But the church itself is not a building. The church is not that organization or denomination where you meet. There are many denominations that call themselves Christians, but their practices, their beliefs are far away from the true Christianity. So the church is not what people think. So what is the church? This church called the church of God that Paul is talking about. The, the word church from the Greek meaning comes from the word ecclesia. There are two words here, ek, which means out of, and kaleo means to call. In other words, ecclesia means the people who have been called out. Many who have been called out. He has called us out from different backgrounds. He has called us out from different families. Some of our families have not been Christian families. Some of our families, you know very well, have been pagan families. They don't believe it. They, they, they're doing their other things. Some are atheists. Some are witchcraft. Some are families of drunkards. So the Lord has called us out from different families. He has called us out from darkness to the light. He has called us out. The Bible calls it a, a holy calling. The Bible terms it a high calling, a calling of hope. He has called us into eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Throughout the Bible, we see that God is fond of calling out. In the Bible, God called Abraham out. Get out of your people. Get out of your nation. So God is a God who calls out. We see Israel called out of Egypt. Moses, go and get my people out of Egypt. We see God called Israel out. So God always calls out. Even today, God is still calling out. He called you out. He called me out. And 
is still calling many out. So we want to see how did this church in the New Testament begin. The church in Acts of Apostles. When we go back to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, we see the Lord promising the Holy Spirit in chapter 1. He told them to stay together, remain in Jerusalem until you are filled with the power from on high. Remain in Jerusalem. In chapter 2, the Bible tells us a scenario where they had been there for some time. And the Bible says in chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with the tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, this is what happened in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came on them. And the Bible says there was a gathering. There was a Jewish gathering from all nations. And when they heard such a mighty noise, people speaking in tongues. And funny enough, oh, interestingly enough, you find that as many as the different tribes or nationalities were there, these people spoke in tongues that they could not understand. I mean that they could understand. It was so interesting. And they wondered, how can they speak in the language that we understand? And that was the miracle of the Holy Spirit. And some made fun of them and said they were drunk. Peter stood up and told them, it is just 9 o'clock in the morning. How can we say we are drunk? So Peter gave the defense. He opened their eyes. He showed them the source. And I like from verse 37, this is where I want us to emphasize from 37. It says, when people heard this, after Peter had explained how it was not just being drunk with, a, not just being drunk with wine, but it was another kind of drunkenness. They were possessed, they were filled by the Holy Spirit. It was the day of Pentecost. So they, the Bible says, and they were cut to the heart. They were convicted, they were touched, they were persuaded. And they asked, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? We have understood. We now know. And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit you think was for us, you will also receive. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who were far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You see here, we are again seeing the calling out. So the word church means the called out ones, as many as the Lord will call. And what happened? With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Praise the Lord. Let's see verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their properties and possessions to give to everyone who had a need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying 
the favor of all, of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, this marks the beginning. This marks the birth of what we call the New Testament church. We see in the Acts of Apostles. The Lord commanded them in chapter 1 to stay together in Jerusalem. In chapter 2, we see the fulfillment of what Joel said many, many years ago, before Jesus came, that the Holy Spirit would be poured upon all flesh. And now, after Peter had explained, people asked, what must we do? And Peter told them, number one, you must repent and be baptized. To repent means to change your mind. To repent means to change your action. To repent means to change your direction. In other words, in repentance, we have three things. Repentance is simply changing your mind from that which you are going to do, from that lifestyle which you are in, from the habits you are in. Repent. Change your mind about it. Number two, change of mind will lead to change of action. Change the actions. That's why I think somebody sang a song and said, the things I used to do, I no longer do them. In other words, I have changed my actions. I have changed my mind. I have changed my action. And not only that, when the mind changes, when the action changes, even the direction changes. So what we call repentance is not a 360 degree turn. No, it is a 180 turn. 180. I was going this direction, then I changed and I faced this direction. This is what true repentance is. I used to like this side. I used to do the things of this side. I used to be of that side. But now I belong to this side. That's what true repentance is. So Peter told them to repent. And the Bible says, with many words, 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ. 3,000 people were called that day. And that marked the beginning of what we call the New Testament church. I want to thank God that he has called you from the background you are in. You are part of the church of Jesus Christ. You are part of the community of believers, those who have been saved, those who have been washed by the blood of Jesus. Now you are a child of God. Now you are born again. Your name is in the book of life. Now you have eternal life. But now let's see from verses 42. How did this church continue? I mean, it is one thing to be born again. It is one thing to start a journey. It is one thing to go to university. It is one thing to begin a business. It is one thing to begin marriage. But finishing is the most important thing. Finishing and finishing strong and finishing well is the most important thing. So the Bible says, and those who turned, who gave their lives to Christ daily, they continued in apostles' teachings. They continued in apostles' teachings. Teaching is one thing you need as a Christian. Teaching will make you the Christian you ought to be. Teaching will make you the Christian husband you're supposed to be. Teaching will make you the Christian student you're supposed to be. Teaching will make you the mother you're supposed to be. Teaching makes a full man. Somebody said, teaching makes a full man. And all of us need teaching. Teaching will help you to know how to work as a Christian. Because, you know, you have joined something you don't know. You don't know. So teaching will open your eyes, will help you know how to work as a Christian, how to enjoy Christianity. We shall teach you how to pray. Salvation is a new relationship with God. The day you say you are saved, you have started a relationship with God, a journey with God. But how do you walk in that journey? How do you maintain that journey? As I said, starting anything is good, but finishing is the most important. Getting saved is good, but continuing saved and finishing saved is the most important thing. 
So, these people continued in apostles' teaching. I want you to know you need a teaching. If you're watching me and you don't have any good church where you go to, you need a Bible teaching church. You need a Bible teaching fellowship where you can be taught how to become a better Christian, how to become the real Christian that you, saved, you are saved to be. Now, through teaching, we shall teach you what salvation is, what prayer is, what faith is. I mean, what is this thing called church is? You will learn many things, basics of Christianity that you're supposed to know. Number two thing that these people continued in, the Bible says they continued in the fellowship. Fellowship. The getting together of believers. That's why in our church, we emphasize a lot on home churches, home fellowships. In the early church, they met from home to home. Their churches were mostly in homes. They broke bread in homes. They had Holy Communion even in homes. You know, they met in homes. And that's what I want to talk about. Allow me briefly to tell you about what a fellowship is. I want to say it doesn't matter how long you have been saved. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter how long you have been saved. It doesn't matter. But what matters is fellowship. However long you have been saved, if you don't fellowship, if you don't meet with other believers, I want you to know your spiritual life will begin to go down. This is where many have failed. Many have begun their journeys very well. But why have they failed on their way? Because of lack of fellowship. Lack of fellowship. Not meeting together. That's why Paul tells us in, I mean the right of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 10, 25. He says, don't give up the habit of meeting together as others do. Don't make it a habit not to fellowship as others, but continue in the fellowship. Now, a fellowship, as to me, I compare it with about three or four things. Number one, I compare fellowship with a petrol station. With a petrol station or a gas station. You cannot go far. A car cannot go far without fuel. So as a Christian, if you want to go far, you need a petrol station. You need where you go and you get more fuel. You get more st spiritual strength, more spiritual stamina. You need fellowship. That's why we emphasize a lot on home fellowship. You need a home fellowship where you can go and be strengthened. Number two, I compare fellowship to a spiritual a garage. You know, a car cannot operate well minus a garage. When a car goes to a garage, they fix it, they change the oil, they do checkups. So even in Christianity, every time you go for fellowship through testimonies, through the sharing of the word of God, through different, you know, the, the, the worship, the singing, you know, the spirit of God puts you together, fixes you up. That's why we go, we come to church when we are weak. We come to church when like our legs, we drag our legs, we don't want to pray. But by the time you go home, you feel, wow, my life has been fixed. I am back to myself. Another thing about fellowship is the fellowship will, is like a spiritual charger. It's a charger. When you see your battery, your phone battery, or your laptop battery, it's going down. What do you do? You take it for charging. When the car battery is low, what do you do? You take it for charging. So the same with our spiritual lives. So a fellowship place is a place where you'll get spiritually charged. You'll find that you don't only have enough fuel. You're not only fixed, but you're also charged to go on, to continue functioning, to continue moving on to continue operating in the name of Jesus. So I want to encourage you that you need a fellowship. You need a fellowship. Another thing is 
through this fellowship, why home fellowships? Because our church emphasizes a lot in home fellowship. We are at a time where we can't meet in the church, in the physical building. We are in a time where we are home because of the pandemic. But all things work together for good to them that love God. I feel in my heart, this thing has come that the church can go back home. We can go back home. We can go back for home meetings. Should we stop prayers? Should we stop fellowship because the physical church is closed? No. We are saying no. So we want to say you need a home fellowship. Why home fellowship? In a home fellowship, exactly where you are, I don't know how many of you are there in that home. You could even be alone. You could be with your neighbors who are born again. You could be a family of two, three, four, five. We can begin home fellowships. The church is supposed to begin from home, not from the physical building. The church is supposed to operate from home. It is supposed to be home first before the physical building. Here, in our church, the physical building, we come for what we call celebration. We just come to, act, to worship God together as a family. We just come to pour our hearts to God. We come to meet together with others. But the real church is supposed to be home. It reminds me of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God told the Jews, Moses told the Jewish families, he says, can you teach your children from home? Teach them when you're eating, teach them when you're walking, teach them from home. So home should be the basis of everything. True Christianity must be home. If we are hot from home, we shall be hot when we come together. If we are cold at home, the same will be in the church. You know, have you heard many times when somebody is saying, you know, the church has been so cold today. I have just learned the church has not been called. It is you and I who have been called. It is you who did not charge your battery from home. It is you who did not get the strength, the petrol station from home. So I just want us to know that there is something that we have been missing, and that is the home fellowship. The home fellowship will help you to have what we call proper feeding. Feeding. Normally when we come to the church where we meet this big congregation, the preacher has little time. The preacher may speak and you don't listen to certain things. You may miss a verse. You may miss a point. You may have come without a pen. You may have come without a, a book or anything to write on. But when we go back home and we begin meeting in the family, in our families, you find that there's what we call proper feeding. What you did not understand from church, you can understand from home. What you did not get from church, you can get from home. Number two, the home fellowship gives us what we call family bonding. A bonding. As the body of Christ, as born again people, each one of us, you need a family. You need a family. Just like we see it in the Old Testament where uh, Cain was talking about his brother. When the Lord asked him, where is your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Is it true Cain was not supposed to take care of his brother? No. The Bible tells us to take care of one another. When we meet together as a small fellowship where we stay, we bond together. We get a belonging. Each one of us, you need identity. You need a place where you are known. Any Christian who does not, who's not known by anybody, you can easily fall. You become a prey to anything. But when you're known, your friends take care of you. The members around take care of you. The day you don't pray, they look for you. When you're sick, they look for you. When you're okay, they look for you. So we, we just want to go back to the family meetings, not only for feeding, but also for family. Another thing about the home meeting or home fellowship is that we function in a big church, a big congregation. It is not easy to function. 
It is people who know what to do that stand in our pulpits in the big churches. But where you are in that small fellowship, a fellowship of two, three, four, five people, there you begin to function. There you find that somebody learns how to open with the word of prayer. Somebody learns to read the Bible from there. Somebody learns to fast from there. Somebody learns the basics of Christianity from there. So there is a learning place. You find that one does one thing, another one does another thing. One learns to read praise and worship. All these things happen in small fellowships. The last one on the list is fruitfulness. You find that in the Bible we are told, the Lord has called us that we may bear fruit. We may bear fruit that remains. Let me read for you the book of John, chapter 15. It talks something about the fruit. John 15. John chapter 15. Look at verse 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples, that you bear much fruit. So through family fellowship, through small meetings, we don't only feed, we don't only function, we don't only become fruitful, but we become much fruitful. Fruitfulness is experienced. We begin to learn how to bear Christian fruits. Let's go to the book of Galatians and we see which kind of fruits are we supposed to bear. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. From verses 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is the desire of God. This is the will of God to all of us, that we may bear fruit. You know, what one of the biggest challenges the church has gone through in our generation is lack of this beautiful Christian fruit to show. We don't, we, we are short of it. Many of us are short of this. And this generation is wondering, are, are you really a Christian? Can a Christian do that? Because we are short of this fruit. At home, we are supposed to bear this fruit. Wherever we go, we are supposed to bear this fruit. We are supposed to show that we are Christians. These are the fruit that prove that we are true Christians. They show maturity. They show that we really, we are the children of the light. These are the things that attract other people to follow us, to be converted, to be born again. I, I like what we read in the book of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, because of their fellowship, because of their continual prayer, because of listening to the apostles' doctrines, the Bible says, and they were filled with the awe. They began to, the fear of God came in the lives of people. When we get into true fellowship, when we begin meeting together, all of us, I tell you the truth, there will be fear of God. The fear of God will come in our midst. We shall begin to walk as Christians. People will see changes in our lives. I'm telling you, there are times you, you tell people you are saved and they say, ah, if you are saved, then I'm also saved. There are times we fear to tell people we are saved. Why? Because we are short of this Christian character, this Christian ethics that we're supposed to have. But through fellowships, we shall become the real people that God wants us to be. And the Bible tells us that because of those 
strong fellowships, because of the teachings, because of the prayers, because of the togetherness of the apostles, the church began to grow. The church began to grow. The church grew spiritually because day by day, these people had teachings. Day by day, these people met in their homes. Day by day, these people broke bread together. They had Holy Communion. Day by day, they prayed. The church grew. The church grew in four ways. Number one, they grew spiritually. They grew from strength to strength. They grew from power to power. They grew from glory to glory. They grew. The church grew spiritually. People grew. People knew what to do. People became stable in their Christian works. People knew what prayer was. People knew what fasting was. People knew what spiritual warfare was. People knew what they were supposed to do. And because of that, they also grew numerically. They began to grow in number. 3,000. If you read Acts of Apostles, you will see people got saved in thousands. And 3,000 got saved. And 4,000 got saved. And 5,000 got saved. I mean, in thousands. Why? Because these people had a secret. These people had a secret. And not only that, signs and wonders and miracles began to follow them. Because they had grown spiritually. They knew how to operate in the word of God. They knew how to operate in the things of God. And not only that, the Bible also said people began to bring. People began to bring whatever they had. They brought whatever they had. People sold their property. They, they, they had nobody in need. They shared. Those are the two characteristics of revival. I think if there's a generation that needs revival, we need a revival more than anybody. They brought whatever they had, and people began to share, to meet the needs of one another in their small fellowships where they are. I want you to know where you are, where you are. You need to meet the needs of one another, especially at a, such a time like this. You need to meet the needs of one another. We are in a pandemic where some people are not working, where some people don't have food, where some people are stranded. I can't, I'm telling you, this is the true story. This morning I was just leaving my home and a Christian who had run away from my side for over two years came. And when she came, she was very weak. I saw her and I saw that she was really going through a hard time. So even before I greeted her, she requested, can I have a seat? Can you help me with the chair I sit? I gave her a seat. But I saw she was weak, like she has not been eating. So what did I do? The first thing I told my children, can you prepare for her some breakfast? Give her some food to eat. So I want you to know, in the early church, nobody lacked. These people cared for one another. These people met the needs of each other. That's what happens in a small fellowship. In our home fellowships, we know one another very well. We know those who are working, and those are not working. We know those who are earning, and those are not earning. We know the education level of each and every person. So I want to encourage us that there's a secret that we need to go to. So these people grow spiritually. Number two, they grow. They grew numerically. Number three, they grew financially. You know, the more the number, the more money. So when people grow spiritually, they grow numerically, and definitely financially. A church where people are mature spiritually, I'm telling you, that church is a tithing church. I thank God for Gaba community. I want to thank God for all of you who, in spite of the lockdown, you drive your car up to church and you bring your tithe. That's a sign of spiritual growth. That's a sign of spiritual growth. I praise God for you. And may God bless you and may God increase you. But these people also grew geographically. They grew from one location to the other. I want to thank God for you. 
I pray for you that may God bless you. I pray that may God increase you. I pray that you get a fellowship. From today, look for a fellowship. Don't stay alone. That is not the will of God. Look for a family near you. If you are near, look for a cell. Look for a home cell. A life group where you can pray from. That will turn your life to another thing. It will help you become a more meaningful Christian. Uh, I pray that the Lord will be with you. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will increase you. I pray that from today, you'll be as strong as the early church in Jesus' name. Amen.